and welcome to this UK LFI Charitable Trust webinar entitled Dear Yassin, A Question of Evidence. I'll begin by wishing our audience a very happy Yom Yerushalayim. Jerusalem Day today marks the reunification of Jerusalem in 1967 after Israel recovered East Jerusalem from Jordanian occupation in the Six Day War. That battle for Jerusalem was of course preceded by clashes in Jerusalem and the surrounding villages in 1948 in the run up to and during Israel's War of Independence. And I'm delighted to be joined from Israel by Professor Eliezer Tauber to discuss his research on this topic for his book, The Massacre That Never Was, The Myth of Dear Yassin and the Creation of the Palestinian Refugee Problem, which has recently been published in English. Professor Tauber was the founder and first chair of the Department of Middle East Studies and the Dean of the Faculty of Jewish Studies at Bailan University. For many years, he was the director of the Menachem Begin Institute for the study of underground and resistance movements. He specializes in the modern history of the Middle East and is a world expert on the emergence of the Arab nationalist movements, the formation of the modern Arab states, and the early phases of the Israeli-Arab conflicts. He's published many other books and articles on these topics, and we're particularly grateful that he joins us to discuss his recent book, which analyzes in detail evidence of the battle in the village of Dir Yassin, and grapples with the false reporting over the battle in the immediate aftermath. It is a, a series of misrepresentations that unfortunately still gain traction today and form the basis of many pseudo legal claims which continue to be advanced in NGO reports and by UN bodies. Now we've had some questions in advance and please ladies and gentlemen put your further questions into the Q&A facility for the discussion after the presentation. Professor Talber, you are very welcome. Thank you very much. You know, Diyasin, the so-called massacre Diyasin is one of the founding myths of the Palestinian people, of the Palestinian narrative. It has been so for the last seven decades or seven and a half decades. Since you can read the entire story in the book, I'll just be very succinct and I will tell you what was a myth and what is the truth. Now, the myth was that in uh, 9th of April, 1948, which is four months after the adoption of the Palestine Partition Resolution, and one month before the termination of the British mandate over Palestine and the establishment of the State of Israel. And that day, in the 9th of April, two Jewish paramilitary organizations, the Irgun, so-called Etzel, and Lehi, some know as a Stern Gang, they attacked a peaceful Arab village called Dir Yassin, west of Jerusalem, and they massacred 254 of its inhabitants. The massacre was accompanied also by rapes and all kinds of other gender-oriented atrocities. This was a myth. No one was questioning it. I mean, some wrote that thousands were killed, some wrote that the entire population of the village was massacred, but those who were more liberal just satisfied themselves with a the number 254, which is completely baseless. Although it was cited in the Times, the New York Times, etc. In my book, I also explain how did this esteemed uh, newspaper reached this number, which has no basic basis at all. So what is a true story of DSM? And how we manage to expose the true story of DSM? The first thing that I understood was that if I want to solely examine an affair which involved both Jews and Arabs, I need to read all the testimonies available by both Jews and Arabs. Surprisingly enough, I was the first one to do it. Either that you have Israeli researchers only using Jewish sources in Hebrew or that you have Arab researchers only using Arab testimony in Arabic. I was the first one who actually decided that I must read both sides of the story 
in order to be able to accomplish a, a so, sort of a combined narrative of the FN. Now, I was very surprised when I read the testimonies of both Jews and Arabs, Jewish attackers and Arab villagers who defended the village. Why I was so surprised? Because the testimonies were very similar at times, almost identical. Namely, I could identify events in that fateful day that were described by both Jews and Arabs and I knew that they were related to the same event. For example, I have a testimony made in the memoirs of a former member, Knesset, Knesset member and minister Yoshua Matza. He passed away several months ago. And he spoke how he and some of his friends in the Lehi organization attacked an Arab house. And then I had a testimony given by one of, of those who inhabited that house. Then she was just a 12 years old girl when she gave the testimony in the 60s, she was older. And she also described the same affair, the same attack, and I could easily sh sh see that this was the same, effect, the same uh, incident. Now, why, as a matter of fact, I ask myself, why should I be so surprised that the testimonies of both Arabs and Jews are so identical? I mean, they both were there when it happened. Now, if, they are not lying. And surprisingly, most of the witnesses didn't lie, not all of course, but most of the witnesses, both Jews and Arabs didn't lie. So if they both were there and they are not lying, apparently the testimony should be similar, even at times identical. So actually there was nothing to be surprised. But of course, when you are prepared, that one side will say there was a massacre, the other side will say there was no massacre, it will be contradictory. This was not the case. So then I realized that basically we don't have two narratives, an Arab one and a Jewish one, but we have four narratives. The narrative of the majority within the Jewish community, the issue, which is identical to the narrative of the majority within the Arab community, namely that there was a massacre. And then we have the narrative of the minorities, those Jewish uh, combatants who attacked Diriasin, either belo belonging to Etzel or to the Lehi, and the narrative uh, delivered by the, eyewit the Arab eyewitnesses, those who were there when it happened. And both sides, namely the Jewish attackers and the Arab defenders gave a very similar narrative, which was completely different from the narrative ad adopted by the mainstreams of both communities. And according to that narrative, there was no massacre. Now, how did I reach the conclusion that there was no massacre? Now, everyone before me was just talking in generalizations. There was a massacre, there was no massacre. Everyone arguing, bringing their, uh, their arguments and reasons and why it was like that and why it was like that. Everyone is talking nothing. I mean, everyone is just saying what is called in Arabic, kalam fire, empty words. I decided to adopt a completely different approach to the affair. An approach which I believe will uh, leave all those supporters of the nar a massacre narrative quite uh, frustrated. Why? Because I told my, to myself, if there was a massacre, there should be people massacred. I mean, you don't have a massacre without people being massacred. I mean, this is base, this, <laughs> what I call basics. So I decided to do what nothing, bef no one before me dared to do or thought that he's able to do, to identify all those Arabs killed in that fateful day. And then after identifying them by name, to use the testimonies, many Arab testimonies, because they knew their Arab neighbors, in order to identify the exact circumstances of death of each of the Arab involved in the affair, those who, who were killed in the affair. And many people told me, you will be unable to do it. I remember that I once asked for a financial support from the Israel Science Foundation and the judges and the reviewers said, 
It's impossible, you can't do it. Because until my book, there was just piles of dead Arabs in the testimonies. And I decided to identify each of those 101 dead Arabs. And after that I identified their names, I looked at the Arab testimonies and I managed to find the exact circumstances of death of almost all of the Arab killed. Not all of them, but almost all of them. Now, when I have a certain person killed in battle or another person killed in battle condition, if I have a person massacred, this is a different issue. So if someone says that there was a massacre in Dir Yassin, and someone said that there was a massacre in Dir Yassin, someone has to prove that people were massacred. I mean, this is basic. Now, if all the people, or more, almost all of the people who were killed in Dir Yassin were not massacred, but they were killed in other circumstances, the conclusion is that there was no massacre. Now, how can people negate my conclusions? If someone wants to say that I'm wrong, it is not enough to say, look, if you're throwing a hand grenade into a house, it should be that such and such percentage of the people should, should get killed, etc., etc. This is not the way. If I gave the exact names of all the Arab killed, and I said this one was killed in that way, this one was killed in that way, if someone wants to contradict me, he needs to show that these Arabs were killed in a different way. Will he be able or she will be able to do it? Probably not. Why? I'm not saying that I managed to screen all available evidence. As an historian, I, I learned quite uh, fast that you can never reach 100% of the sources. But I believe that I managed to reach 95% of the sources, which is very good. So if someone want to contradict my conclusions, he, need, he needs to find other sources that will show that my results are incorrect, namely that these people died differently. So this is how I reached the conclusion that there was no massacre, by identifying the names of all the Arab killed and then identifying or verifying the exact circumstances of death of each of the Arab killed. So basically my general method in this book was to combine both narratives of the Jewish attackers and the Arab defenders and inhabitants, not the narratives offered by the mainstreams, either Jewish or Arab, who weren't there when it happened, only using the testimonies of the people who were there. And as I said, told you, it was quite easy to do it because the testimonies were very similar at times identical. And then by using the testimonies of both sides, I managed to produce a combined narrative of what happened at Dir Yassin, and I believe it to be the true narrative of what, of what happened. So basically there was no massacre, there were no rapes, there was only one woman, one woman identified by name but not by, she didn't give the testimony. An Arab, a, a, a British a CID inspector wrote that in a report that he interviewed that Arab woman, he identified her by her name. She was called Safiya Atia. And then he said that she told him that she was raped. And this testimony of this British inspector was later on cited by Collins and Lapierre in their famous book, O Jerusalem, which give me many fairy stories about Dir Yassin. So since I know all the people in Dir Yassin, I have a gene genealogical trees of all the male and I know, I know most of the women, I could easily identify this Safiya Atiya and follow her a minute after minute throughout the entire day. By testimonies of her close relative who delivered testimonies about what happened to, the, to her and she was not raped, she and her sister and, the, her, and, the, and her niece were all uh, taken prisoner by the Jewish organization and the, those who guard them were women, not men. And the rape story was a complete fake. Now, of course, there are those who are very adamant to prove that there were, were rapes in Dir Yassin and then I will soon explain to you why. And, that they, and then they say, you cannot believe the Arabs 
who claims that there were no rapes because of the sensitivity of the, of the matter of rape within Muslim societies. So basically everyone is lying, just so who adhere to the massacre narrative are telling the truth. Now, why the rape accusation is so important, which will later bring me on to the entire importance of the entire GSM affair. The rape accusation is very important because after accumulating huge amount of testimonies, not just from people from DRC, but also from people from other regions in the, in the then called Palestine, British Mandatory Palestine, it was quite clear to me that the Palestinians decided to flee Palestine not before because of the massacre accusation, but because of the rape accusation. Now I'll bring you rape accusation and ask some other horrible uh, propaganda stories spread by the Arab leaders. I will bring you, for example, one story that you will understand what is the meaning of, a pro of propaganda, of false propaganda. For example, here I, give, I will bring you a story later, uh, nowadays also cited by the famous uh, exile, uh, a Muslim, pre exile Muslim preacher Karadawi, and it goes like that. As a climax of cruelty, certain Jewish terrorists laid wagers on the sex of the unborn babies of expectant mothers. The wretched women were cruelly disemboweled alive, the wounds drawn out and searched for the evidence which would determine the winner, which would determine the winner. As someone once told me, if he would believe that this is what is going to happen to his family, his own family, he would also flee away. So why was this story uh, spread all over Palestine. When the stories about Dira Sin reached the Secretary General of the Arab Higher Committee, who was the last, uh, was a senior Arab uh, politi political authority in Jerusalem, he decided that he must make the most of it. Namely, you know, people blame him that he's the one. Uh, uh, responsible for the Nakba, for the catastrophe befallen of the Palestinians. I'm more liberal with him. I'm saying he wanted to prevent a catastrophe, but eventually he created one. Why? Because he was a very sober and pragmatic politician. And he understood that the Palestinians had no chance against the Jews. In another uh, study of mine, I proved that the local Palestinians were a minority when counting only combatants uh, in comparison to the number of Jewish combatants. So he under, fully understood that the Palestinians combatants had, had no chance against the Jewish combatants and they were going, to, the Jews were going to win. And he wanted to force all the Arab countries around Palestine to intervene and send their armies to save the Palestinians. Eventually we know that even when they send the, the armies, they too, and most of them were defeated by the Jews. But of course, he couldn't know that. So he decided to lay pressures on the Arab governments by spreading false rumors about a massacre that never happened and about all kinds of atrocities that will cause the Arab general public in the Arab states to lay pressures on their government because he understood, fully understood that the Arab governments were not interested in intervening in Palestine to help the Palestinians. They couldn't care less about the Palestinians. But he hoped that he will be able to raise the masses of the public in the Arab states in order that they, they would lay pressure on the Arab governments to send their armies, which eventually happened. So he decided to spread all this kind of, uh, of stories and it backfired. It was a boomerang, it boomeranged. The Arabs, the Palestinians believed, were the first to believe his stories and immediately they started to run away. For, not just around Jerusalem, throughout Palestine. For example, I have a testimony of an Arab a pregnant woman from Nazareth. She's telling, she is telling her husband, what do you want? That they will come here and open my, my belly apart too? We must go. And all kinds of these kinds of testimony which show how the false rumors spread by the Arab leadership about the Yassin caused the Arab flight. Now, this is why the entire story of the Yassin is so important. I mean, if it was just a matter of a middle-sized village 
conquered by the Jews, there were ma many other such in instances in the 1948 war. But the story of Dirasin is different because of the consequences. I, I wouldn't dare to say that because, just because of Dirasin, the Palestinians fled Palestine. There were many reasons. I know about some very, some other important reasons, which I'm not going to detail now. But evidently, the false rumors spread about the Yassin were a major factor, which cannot be overestimated, that caused the Palestinian population to flee. And this is why the story of the Yassin is much more important than just a conquest of a single middle-sized Arab village near Jerusalem. This is one of the turning points in the 1948 war. And this was so identified by the Arabs themselves. I have all the kind of testimonies for the Arab leaders. It was so identified by the British. It was so identified also by the Israeli intelligence, which there is a, an article written by Benny Morris about the Israeli intelligence and its conclusions about what caused the Palestinian flight. And Benny Morris also agree, agrees about it. The Dirasin was one of the major factors causing the Palestinian flight. So basically, this uh, secretary, secretary general of the Arab Higher Committee called Dr. Hussein Fakhri al Khalidi, he wanted to save his people and he caused a catastrophe. Well, this is the story of Dirasin in brief, the true story of Dirasin and what it caused the Palestinians. And now, if you are so willing, I'm open to hear your questions. Thank you. Well, Professor Tauber, thank you very much indeed for such a, an erudite uh, opening uh, on the battle, as you say, of the 9th of April 1948. The subsequent false narratives that arose uh, from the episode have been countered, uh, it seems, on occasion by those present. Uh, and by those involved in the development of the false reporting that you um, have briefly described, notably in a BBC documentary, which was aired in 1998 called 50 Years of Conflict. Uh, I think it's worth uh, watching together a short extract from that documentary, which includes an interview with a survivor from the village and the testimony of Hazem Zaki Nuseyba, who took a false press release just after the battle. Let's watch a few minutes of this together. We gathered in Jerusalem at the Hebron gate. We checked who was missing and who had survived. Then the Palestinian leaders arrived, including Dr. Khalidi. I asked Dr. Khalidi how we should cover the story. He said, we must make the most of this. So he wrote a press release stating that at Deir Yassin, children were murdered, pregnant women were raped, all sorts of atrocities. Arab radio stations passed on the false reports, ignoring the protests of the witnesses. We said there was no rape. He said we have to say this so the Arab armies will come to liberate Palestine from the Jews. This was our biggest mistake. We did not realize how our people would react. As soon as they heard that women had been raped at Deir Yassin, Palestinians fled in terror. They ran away from all our villages. In the next few months, over half the Arab population, three quarters of a million people, fled their homes in Palestine. I should say that the beginning of the interviewee's response isn't quite translated into English. In Arabic, he says there was no slaughter, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, Professor, and no rape. And he makes a, a cutting movement, it seems, with his hands when he speaks of slaughter and a pushing movement when he speaks of rape. That was the interview of the witness. And of course, there follows the testimony of Hazem Zaki Nuseiba, 
I ought to perhaps stress that he is a, a Jordanian politician and a diplomat of Palestinian descent. He's a member of the old Nuseiba family, a very important family in East Jerusalem. And, and amongst other posts, he was Jordan's Minister of Foreign Relations, Ambassador to Egypt and Permanent Representative to the United Nations. He's also known as, as an important figure in the movement for Arab nationalism. So no reason uh, to really provide the very honest account that he's given, that he took this false press release dictation from Dr. Kaladi. Um, what's your impression of these interviews and how is this information perhaps factored into your own research? Well, basically I know these two fellows. The first one called by the BBC as Abu Mahmoud is actually Muhammad Mahmoud Assad Radwan Akil, who was one of the most important witnesses about Yassin. He gave many testimonies since the days of Yassin until he passed away in uh, 2012. And uh, he was one of the most important witnesses that could show, that could, that could teach you that there was no uh, massacre in Yassin. He, he mentioned it. I mean, th they were taken into the office of Hossein Fakhri al Khalidi. And he's, what he told them, we are going to say there was massacre, there were rapes, and they are telling him it's, it's lies. And he's actually forced them to lie because he said, this is what will save the Palestinians. And then later on, I mean, they were forced by him, but later on, they gave uh, two testimonies to the, uh, to the uh, in, in, completely different from what he was saying. Now, the second one, Hazem Nuseiba, I mean, he is just a record as he recorded there in, the, in, this, in this TV series for about one minute. But I know from my own, uh, what, uh, when I was interviewed by the Israeli TV about my book, about the Hebrew edition of my book, they were in my house for three hours and then they show me just for two minutes on, <laughs> on TV. So I realized that when Nuseiba was interviewed by the BBC and we show him for about one minute, probably there was a type, type script of a long interview with him that was not expressed in this TV series. So I decided to locate the archives of this TV series. And I managed to find the original documents of the TV series in St. Anthony's College in the University of Oxford. And indeed there was a, 20, a 32 page interview with Hazem Nuseiba. And I cited many excerpts, excerpts from this interview in my book. He said many other very important things. He's one of the main witnesses explaining how the massacre invention was actually invented because it did not just happened that people uh, spoke about massacre. It was intentionally invented. The fake story was intentionally invented. Not just that there was no massacre, but that it was an intentional decision to create a massacre story. And he's very open about speaking about this. But he's not the only one. There were many witnesses from Diyasin. For example, there was a couple of survivors from Diyasin interviewed by, by a Palestinian interviewer. I mean, if they are interviewed by foreigners, it could be different, but when they are interviewed by one of their own people, then they are telling the truth. And he's asking them, where are the rapes? And say, no, it's a lie. Did they uh, kill someone? No, it's a lie. So then the interviewer, you see that can, he reached the conclusion. He said, so basically the Israelis, it exonerated the Israelis from this accusation, but on the way we lost our lands. At that moment, I saw that this Palestinian interviewer, these Palestinian researchers understood the entire story the very way that I managed to understand it. I'll move to some of the questions from the audience now. Um, it, it's interesting, perhaps, that the content of that interview um, and that documentary uh, all those years ago in 1998 hasn't been uh, more widely discussed. Uh, but one of the first questions we've had through is, why do you think the narrative that a massacre did occur was accepted so easily by the Jewish Israeli society? And can we derive any lessons from how the unsupported narrative took off so easily? Well, I'm an expert on the Arab-Israeli conflict, not on the Israeli-Israeli conflict, but I'll try to answer it anyhow. But the, those two dissident organizations, so they were called dissident organizations, the Etzel, the Irgun, and the Lehi, were the minority within the Jewish community, within the Jewish issue. And the majority, which was uh, identified with the main militia, namely the Haganah, wanted to exploit this affair in order to smear the name 
of the, of the minor Jewish organization. But nevertheless, I should emphasize the Haganah and the Jewish left didn't invent the Dir Yassin massacre narrative. They only exploited it. The massacre narrative was invented by the Arab leadership. It is very important to understand it. Even when people don't like the fact that the Israeli left exploited the affair to its own interest, nevertheless, he didn't invent the affair. Two, there was one, there was one uh, Israeli uh, senior officer called Mayor Pail. He was claiming all the years that he was there when it happened it's there, and that there was a massacre. He was not there. I managed to find in the Israeli, uh, in the Israel Defense Force archives, a, a report that he wrote later on that he was not there. And even I can bring you now in this, uh, bring you a scoop that it was already too late for my book in English, but just lately I managed to find an interview with Mayor Pail in some unimportant uh, site where he actually admitted at last that he was not in Diriasin when it happened. I, in my book, proved that he was not. I have many proofs for this. But now I see that he actually, short while before he died, he admitted that he was not there. So people were using his testimonies as if he was there to base their claims that there was a massacre. It was in accordance with their interest to, to present the minor Jewish organizations as murderers and people who do not fit to govern Israel. I mean, it took the right 29 years later on uh, to, to, to reach a government, the government to, to win the elections, not just because of the innocent sin form, for, because of many, many factors. So they definitely exploited it, but they didn't invent it. Well, thank you. That is helpful. Um, looking to the next question, uh, it's whether or not the situation has changed uh, from that you've described. Has the book, um, so far as you're aware, made any impression on the views of the Israeli powers? Uh, and if not, why not? So have there been repercussions as a result of the research that you've conducted? Well, I tell you, this is a very interesting story. We can have a show just on the, on the issue of how the book was published. I wrote it originally in English. What you have now in English, this is the original book. And for two years, I tried to convince university presses in the, in the United States to publish it. And all of them said, it's a great book. It is a very strong book. We, it is precisely why we are not going to publish it. For example, we have a very famous, I'm not going to mention names, but we have a very famous university press known all over the world. And they said, the book might inflame a debate. I mean, Academy is afraid of inflaming a debate. There was another university press saying, it will probably sell well, but we will get a terrible reputations in the eyes of anyone who is, do not belong to the right. So here you have an academic argument why not to publish the book. And then you have one of the university presses of the Ivy League. Again, I'm not mentioning names. And they said, the book is excellent. It is very strong. Everyone favored the book. We are not going to publish it because the Palestinians are in a miserable situation enough as it is. So what I'm saying here, you have academics from very top universities, and believe me, those academics who are sitting in the, in the academic committees of university presses, they are the top professors of their universities. I mean, in the business, I know that. And here you have top professors betraying their academic mission for political considerations. So when I saw this was the case, I translated myself into Hebrew. It was accepted within five days after I offered it to the top publishing house in Israel called Kinneret Press. And then later on, when it was already published in Hebrew, eventually I published it in English by a trade publisher because no university press has the guts to publish it. They are simply afraid. But in, in my opinion, they betrayed their academic mission. But anyhow, they were also stupid. What, 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 what did they think? That they will be able in the 21st century to censor a book that eventually the book will not, is not going to publish and they will be able to conceal its findings. I mean, it's not going to, maybe 50 years ago, it was like that in the Bolshevik 
regimes, but it's not going to work today. And now the book is published and everyone can read it and decide for it himself or herself whether they accept the new narrative of the lesson. Well, there are clearly several audience members who have read the book and we've got some detailed questions coming through. Um, in some of the analysis, uh, you explain that the battle was far more fierce than the Lehi and Edsel forces who fought there had expected. Um, you describe these units as young and inexperienced um, and that these forces met far more resistance than anticipated. There were gun positions installed on the roofs of many of the houses in the village. There was a, a fierce exchange of fire. Uh, and you report one of the survivors, um, Muhammad Aish Zaidan, uh, explaining that the Arab combatants were fighting the Jewish fighters from house to house uh, and from street to street, perhaps in contrast to, to many of the other battles that had taken place in the run up to Deir Yassin. But it's a situation where we have the combatant and non-combatant population living in the same houses. And it seems from your research, um, on occasion, some relatives would be shooting uh, out of the houses um, with uh, the, the rest of their family um, in, in their presence so that when fire was returned, that they would be at the receiving end of it. In, in the context of that, one of the questions that has come through um, is um, specifically asking uh, if the Jewish combatants were so undisciplined and untrained, how come the casualties, uh, especially in the context that I've just described, were so low? They were in the open and unprotected area, unlike the villages in, in those fortified houses. Uh, has your research thrown up any possible answer to that question? Well, first I should explain, I mean, Dirson was a real tragedy. It is one of the absurdities of history. Someone, people are happy about what happened to them and they don't realize that actually this is a disaster. And I will explain. No one knew in advance how much weaponry, how many weapons there were in Dirson. And there was a reason for this. There was no many rifles and machine guns in Dirson a month before. However, the people of Diriasin who were afraid of an imminent Jewish attack, they, didn't, they weren't afraid for Metzel of Lefe, they were afraid that the Haganah would attack them. And they sent a, a mission to Egypt to buy, to purchase arms. And that mission was detained by the Egyptian authorities because they, they bought the arms in the black market for a whole month. And they returned with the, with the weapons five days before of the attack. And they brought with them two brand guns, which is a heavy, heavy weaponry of the period, and about 60 rifles, most of them semi or most of them semi semi-automatic. So no one knows, not Zagana, not at Salehi, were aware that basically DSN became a depot of armament. I mean, they thought that they were just going to a trip of, of one after of a, an early morning trip, and within an hour it, everything is finished, and they didn't realize. The fire that they were going, the, the fire that was going to face them. This is why the battle evolved as it is. So basically, the fact that the people of Dirasin managed to get their weaponry just five days before of the attack was the reason behind their disaster. Because if they wouldn't have weaponry, they would all run away and save their life. But because they had lots of weaponry, they decided to remain and fight the invaders because also they didn't understand that the invaders came there to stay for good, because until then it was just a matter of hit and run in all the former uh, attacks of this sort. So this is why it evolved the way it evolved. Now, with regard to the numbers, the, the absolute numbers are misleading. This is not just because, you know, five attackers were killed and one other than one of the villagers. So the numbers are completely misleading because it is not just a matter of how many were killed, but how many of how many. I mean, if 100 are killed of 1,000 inhabitants, it's 10 percent. But if 100 are, 100 are killed from 100 attackers, it is 100 percent. So basically, it's also important what is the size of the population of each of the side. And we have here five killed out of about 120. This is about 4%. And on the other hand, we have 
about 100 killed of a population of 1,000, which is about 10%. Now, 4% is the difference between 4% and 10% is not so impressive. And in this case, it's also very reasonable. Why it is so reasonable? Because all the 120 combatants, Jewish combatants, were armed. While only, while only about 70 to 80 of the Arab defenders were armed. And if you are armed, you have much better chances to remain alive in such a chaotic battle. This is why I managed to trace a very interesting phenomenon that many heads of Arab families remains alive while most of the members of the families were killed. Why? Because those heads of families were armed combatants. Therefore, they were equipped with better abilities to remain alive throughout the battle. And civilians without arms, of course, they have less, lesser abilities to remain alive throughout such a battle. And this is the main reason why Eventually, we have only 4% of the attackers killed and 10% of the Arab population killed. We've had several questions uh, coming in as to the purpose of the battle India, Yassine. Could you perhaps describe um, Operation Nashon and give a little bit of a context for uh, why Dear Yassine was the site of, of this battle and, and also why was it that Etzel and Lehi fighters uh, were involved in this battle as opposed to the Haganah? Well, Operation Nashon was intended to open the road to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a, under an Arab siege and the Haganai decided to open the road to Jerusalem to save the city from the Arab siege. Diriasin was one of the villages which uh, threatened the road to Jerusalem. Actually, I will show you now. I do just for a moment, half a moment, I will do share screen. You can see this is an aerial photo taken in 1946. I managed to find it in an archive in Israel. And this, is, this photo was taken by, by a British plane. Uh, and I, when I saw it, and the people in the archive told me, take the file, don't take a print. Why? Because you will be able to enlarge the files in, in, in software that didn't exist, of course, in 1946. So those British who took this photo, they have an excellent analogic cameras to take it but they could use only magnifying glass in order to see the details. But I nowadays can enlarge it 100 times more. And when I enlarge the aerial photo, before that you couldn't see anything. Now you can see the entire village. Here you have the village of Zirasin, each of the 144 houses. And I had to check each of them because I knew in each house, which is a family that lived there. So we have 144 houses. Now I show you now another thing, how it endangered the road to Jerusalem. North to the village, there were trenches dug, dug by, the Turks, by the Ottoman Turks during World War I. So it was north of the village. This is the road from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv. And these are the trenches. I have also very good uh, uh, photos taken from the Library of Congress uh, from inside these tre th those trenches that you can see how you can shoot from the trench directly on the road. So basically, Dirasin was one of the villages that had to be taken by Zagana. Zagana, I will stop the share screen now. Zagana has another purpose. It wanted to uh, build a small airfield near Dirasin and the, the airfield had to be longer than they could do with the existence of the village. So it was very important for them to move the village away. Actually, the very same day of the attack, the Agra decided that they had to, to move this village away. However, the attack was carried out by Etzel and Lehi. When they told the Agra that they were going to attack it, the Agra offered other possibilities, which were, which were more important for the Agra. But Etzel and Lehi were very small organizations and they were afraid that other options were beyond their capabilities. And as I already explained, Diriasin was supposed to be an easy task. And this is why they chose Diriasin. Eventually it was not an easy task at all, but this is what they thought in advance. And this is why they decided this, to attack Diriasin. But if they wouldn't do it, the Agana would do it in a later day. That's for sure. And actually, I should mention another point because we, we talked before how the Agana exploited the affair to smear the name of the minor organization. 
זה הגנה also try to hide the fact that striking force זה פלמח assisted at Senelechi in the operation. Two units of פלמח came to the Yasin and helped at Senelechi in the battle. And later on the הגנה tried to conceal this fact because he would, it wanted to smear the organization and it denied the fact that uh, פלמח units uh, participated in the attack, but I have a report handwritten by the commander of the, of the פלמח who commanded the פלמח forces in the attack, he was called uh, Yaakov Egg, and he is explicitly describing his entire participation in the attack. And we've had a, a few questions actually going to why it was that uh, members of the Haganah would have engaged in such a smear campaign against Etzel and Lechi. But of course, when we consider how close this was in time and the proximity to the Altalena affair uh, and the order that was given to, to shoot them in the water, perhaps it gives a little bit of color um, and un better understanding to, from today's perspective of the real animosity that existed. Um, between these groups? Is that something that, that you think? Well, Ben Gurion has his own rights. He decided to declare the establishment of the State of Israel and we shouldn't forget it. You know, it was not Begin who did it, it was Ben Gurion. Nevertheless, Ben Gurion has his own faults and the, the story of Altalena is one of them. It could end differently. I'm not an expert on Altalena, I'm not going to speak about Altalena, but evidently there was. Uh, significant hatred between the bo both sides. Nevertheless, I should uh, say in favor of David Shaltel, who was the Agana commander in Jerusalem. He hated Etzel and Lechi. And as much as he hated them, he all, this, all that day he supplied them with ammunition and, uh, and helped them to take out the wounded from the village. So here you have a Haganah commander, educated and trained, to hate his opponents. And nevertheless, he decided to help them against the, against the will of his superior in Tel Aviv. And Mayor Pale was telling them, well, telling him, they are the enemies, we should shoot them. And he's telling, and he's answering Mayor Pale, well, they are Jews, you know, we cannot shoot them in the back. So at that point, I was much impressed by the personality of David Shaltel. And later on, Mapam, pressed, they were the far left, and they pressed ben -Gurion to fire him because of that, ben -Gurion refused. Because eventually, David Shildil did what he had to do. And as much as he hated them, he understood that eventually it is a matter of Jews against Arabs and not Jews against Jews. So he would prefer that they would do whatever he told them and not operate independently. But when it came to the fact, he supplied them throughout the entire day with ammunition. And this was the reason why they, why they came victorious, because the size of the, the, of the power, manpower of the defenders and those who attacked them was quite similar and they have quite similar quantities of weaponry. However, when the Arabs ran out of ammunition, no one of the Arab, other Arab villages or forces came to help them. While the Agana all the time supplied Etzel and Lechi with ammunition. And I should mention that in the village of Ein Karim, only just two kilometers from Dir Yassin, 20 minutes running, there was a force of the rescue army commanded by Fawzi al kaugji 150 armed combatants. Now, you should see what the villagers of Dir Yassin managed to do to the attackers. If those 150 armed trained soldiers of the army, of the rescue army would come to Dir Yassin 20 minutes away, they would slaughter the, probably the forces of Essen and Lehi. But when the refugees from Diyasin ran out and ran out to Diyas to Enkari, which was the closest village possible, the, the, the Arab soldiers told them, we don't have orders from our commanders to assist you and we cannot go without orders. And where are your commanders? Everyone is participating in the funeral of Abdul Qadr al Hussein in East Jerusalem, in Arab Jerusalem. So at least give us your arms. No, a soldier doesn't give his arm. So actually they abandoned them in face of the Jewish attackers. And one of the fascinating things about the book is the level of detail you go into with specific individuals, their relationships with each other, their history and their interactions. Um, we've had a few more questions about the um, 
origins of, of the Dia Yassin operation. Uh, and one in particular asks, to what extent do you believe that the Etzel Lehi attack on Dia Yassin was a direct result of the British refusal to protect convoys traveling on the road to Jerusalem? You've explained the significance of the proximity of, of the road to Jerusalem to Dia Yassin. And also, is there any truth that the Hadassah convoy massacre four days later uh, which was a massacre, the questioner clarifies, was a revenge attack for the alleged massacre in Dir Yassin. Okay, so these are two separate answers and I will answer them separately. Yes. The first question, not just, uh, it's not just related to the British, there was a much wider uh, picture. Namely, Etzel and Lehi were afraid that eventually the United Nations will decide to international Jerusalem and it will become an international city and that the mainstream Haganah and the Jewish issue will agree to this. So they decided to widen the conflict into Jerusalem in order to prevent sort of a peaceful agreement between Ben Gurion and Abdallah about Jerusalem. Personally, I think that they were wrong. I don't think that Ben Gurion would reach an agreement with Abdallah to abandon Jerusalem. I mean, he was ready to abandon Arab Jerusalem, but not the new city. It is what not going to happen. But they were afraid and they wanted to widen the battlefront in order to force the Jewish forces to fight the Arabs also over Jerusalem in order uh, to decide the fate of Jerusalem by force and not by agreements with Abdallah and the United Nations. This is for the first question. The second question, it is very important to understand Although many people later on claimed that the attack on the Hadassah convoy was a revenge about the Rasin, this was not the fact. This was not the fact. Why? Because I also read the Arab sources dealing with the attack on Hadassah. Now the Arabs knew that the Haganah was infiltrating its soldiers throughout the Hadassah convoys to Mount Scopus. And therefore they wanted to attack the, the convoy and they would attack it anyhow. And they decided to attack it even before this, the story of Dir Yassin. And the attack would take place in any case. It is true that people, when they attack the convoy, they shout revenge for Dir Yassin. And maybe the results were more severe because of what happened in Dir Yassin. But the very decision to attack the convoy to Adassa was related to the attack on Dir Yassin. And the same applied to the, to the massacre in Gush Etzion. People then said, they massacred the defendant of Gush Etzion because of Dir Yassin. It is true that many of the Arabs attacking the defenders of Gush Etzion said, we will revenge Dir Yassin, but this was not the reason for the attack. Gush Etzion stood in a very strategic location for the Arab region, and the Arab region had to erase it from its position. And it, it would, the Arab region would attack Gush Etzion anyhow, with Dir Yassin or without Dir Yassin. So both attacks, were irrelated to what happened in Dir Yassin, even the people there shouted, we will revenge for Dir Yassin. One question here asks about the significance of the word massacre. Um, now, uh, the significance of that in English may, may be one thing. Um, how does that reflect the Hebrew word that is being used? Um, we heard in the interview of the survivor earlier that um, the Arabic word was slaughter, perhaps best uh, translated as slaughter rather than massacre. Um, the questioner asked, does the use of the word reflect the number of killings or the style of killings? And of course, you go in a lot of detail in your book to the, the numbers um, that perished and also the manner in which they died. So what are your views on the terminology that's being uh, used in the context of, of the myth of Deocene? Yes, people, many, many people ask, ask me, why didn't I open with an introductory chapter about the definitions of a massacre? Well, I'm not a jurist, I'm an historian. So I know that there is someone saying is if you are killing more than 10 people, then it's a massacre, less and it is not. So if this famous combatant who shot uh, who machine gun the family there, and according to the true Arab version, he killed 11, so it was a massacre. But according to the version of Etzel and Lehi, it was only nine, so it's not a massacre. I was not interested in such definitions. For me, they were unimportant. For me, the definition was very clear. It is a massacre when you, you line up families against a wall without arms, and you shoot them so to death. This is a massacre. When you are attacking, in the middle of a battle and you're being fired at and you're trying to silence a fire in order to save your own lives, 
it is a life, it is not a massacre. And I will bring you a very horrible example. There was a center, certain Arab fighter called, he was an old one, 60 or 70 old, but he was a shooting. He was shooting from the window of his house. He was called Muhammad Zaharan. And beside him was a cradle with a four months year old girl, old baby. And she was in a cradle beside him and he was shooting with, a, with his rifle at the Lehi attackers. And one of the Lehi attackers in order to silence the fire, throw a hand grenade into the window. So this little baby was fired, it was burned alive. Now, in my definition, she was not massacred because that Lehi fighter was trying to silence the fire, of course, in order to accomplish the tax and to save his own life. He even didn't know about that little baby uh, lying in the cradle near the Arab who was shooting at him. And we have many such examples. This is why I said it was not massacred by people because the Arabs were killed either as combatants, about a quarter of those killed, or most of the rest in what I call in combat conditions. Namely, the people are standing or sitting beside people who are shooting and when the, silent, the fire is silenced, they are killed as well, usually by hand grenades or, or something of the sort. So this, this was my definition for, the, for why it is not a mistake and it is very clear. So when I titled my, my book, The Massacre, the, 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 when, it, when I titled the book, that there was no massacre in Diracin, I meant that whatever was known about Diracin until this point is incorrect, is false. If you want, to know about what really happened in Diracin, you need to read the book. So this is why I call it the massacre that never was. The massacre that everyone believed to be, it to be, never was. What did happen? You can read about it in the book. There were some people who were killed without arms, but only very few. So in general terms, what everyone knew about Diracin is completely false. What is true is what is written in my book. This is the first book giving the true picture of what happened in the US and the consequences. And coming to those consequences, um, and you've described the impact that it had on the local uh, Palestinian Arab community. Um, given those consequences, why hasn't Dr. Kaladi been more demonized for his exaggerations? the impact that it had on, on the Arab cause has been uh, tremendous, whichever way we look at it. Okay, this, uh, this uh, question actually touches a major issue, but I, because Khalidi actually caused a catastrophe, but the damage was already done. So now what should the Palestinians do? Reprimand Khalidi for what he did, say, we actually ran away for no reason because no one was going to massacre us because there was no massacre yes, and no one raped anyone. They are not going to say because the damage is already done. They, they left Palestine. There was a Palestinian exodus. They are no longer, long, longer here. So it is better for them to cling to the massacre narrative and say, we fled Palestine in order to save our lives, in order not to be massacred by the Jews, the way they massacred the people of Dir Yassin. They were unable to admit the truth. So who are those who insisted on the truth? The people of Dir Yassin who remained alive, nine tenths of them. And they, all the time they said the truth and no one wanted to listen to them. For example, there was a testimony of one of the women from Dir Yassin. She, she, she related that she, that she was asked by a woman from Jerusalem, is it true that every woman in Dir Yassin from the age of six to 70 was raped? And that woman, Fedri Yassin, telling the Jerusalemite woman, no one was raped. And the woman, and the woman from Jerusalem is telling her, Uskuti Akasbana, namely, shut up, you are a liar. Everyone knows that every woman, woman in Dir Yassin was raped. So basically they didn't want to listen to the people of Dir Yassin to, to listen to what really happened there. So nowadays, they are left with a catastrophe. It is far more complicated for them to admit that basically the catastrophe happened to them for no real reason. Given all that, that I, given everything that I said now, I don't think that one actually should reprimand Hussein Khalidi. He couldn't know in advance the effect that his story would cause. He knew one thing for sure, that the Palestinians are going to lose. 
he actually just wanted to save his people. What he did caused a catastrophe, but he couldn't tell that in advance. No one could know it in advance. Of course, if he wouldn't even suspect it would happen like that, he wouldn't do it. But he just tried to save his people, and from his point, he was doing his best. He boomeranged, but he couldn't tell that in advance. So in my own humble opinion, as I wrote in my, in my book, he wanted to prevent a catastrophe, but he created one. But this phrase has two parts. He also wanted to prevent a catastrophe. Professor Tauber, a, a final question to end with. Of course, we have your book, The Massacre That Never Was, The Myth of Dear Yassin and the Creation of the Palestinian Refugee Problem. Uh, it's available uh, from all good booksellers and online in hard copy and on Kindle. Um, the question, uh, the last one that I'll pose to you from our audience is, what do you think is required to achieve wider recognition of the myth of Dear Yassin? Do you have any uh, recommendations for our audience members uh, after the wealth of information that you've uh, conveyed to them? Well, tell it to other people. I, you know, when my book was first published in Amazon, immediately Palestinians, one after the other, wrote reviews, genocide denial, genocide denial, what genocide denial? But this is, oh, don't, everything written in that book is lies, don't buy it. I mean, pop, pop, pop. For sure, this person didn't buy the book and didn't read even a single word. So immediately, my, the score of my book was one out of five. But then other people who started to read it started to write positive reviews, five-star reviews, and nowadays it is already four. This is not the case with a good read site. Site there, it is all, it's still 1.44, something. So, so I'm telling you, don't just read the book and tell it to your friends. Also write positive reviews in all these kind of sites like Amazon and uh, Book Depository and Goodreads. It is very important that other people will know that basically those Palestinians are trying to prevent you from reading the book, to censor the book because its content is unpleasant for them and they want them to censor it. So you should do the opposite and make it, make it become known to everyone that you know. Well, I hope very much that you will have the opportunity to uh, explain the contents of the book in many more fora uh, and that it will be far more widely read. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for the time and for imparting all of the information in the book, of course, and also summarising so much of it for our audience uh, this evening. Thank you so much and uh, we'll see everyone next time.